The following presentation was recorded at the 2011 Southeast Linux Fest in Spartanburg, South Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond and Platinum sponsors in 2011 for helping make these videos possible. <coughs> we have as our presenter today, Leslie Hawthorne, who has uh, quite a lovely resume here. I'm expressing my own jealousy over it, having been the representative for open source at Google and also she's currently working as an open source uh, relations manager for Oregon State University, which is a lovely little uh, state on its own. So, Thank you, sir. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. And I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank all of the organizers of the Southeast Linux Fest Conference for bringing us all together today. Let's give them a round of applause, please. So today I'm going to be talking about humanitarian free and open source software. And the purpose of this talk is twofold. Uh, one is to inform some of you folks in the audience about various humanitarian FOSS projects that you might want to consider contributing to or encouraging other people that you know to contribute to these projects because it's great to write beautiful code. It's even cooler to write beautiful code that helps other people live better lives. So to give you a little bit of background about me, um, this is a beautiful picture of the state of Oregon to which I recently transplanted myself after living for my entire life in Silicon Valley. Uh, I left Google in April of 2010 and then joined the Oregon State University Open Source Lab in October of last year. Um, are any folks in the audience familiar with the OSU Open Source Lab? All right, that's not enough. Fabulous. I have a purpose. Um, so the OSU Open Source Lab was founded in 2005 and it actually grew up sort of organically as part of the central IT department at Oregon State University. Basically, we had some data center space. It wasn't being used. And we had a lot of friends at various Linux distributions who needed hosting. So from that humble beginning in 2005, we've grown now to hosting over 100 open source projects, many of which you've no doubt heard of. Uh, we host kernel.org, the Linux Foundation, Apache, Drupal, and a lot of other awesome stuff, Nagios, stuff you guys like. So usually you're hitting our FTP mirrors when you're downloading something, yay us. And, um, <clears throat> the obligatory thing, we are entirely donor funded, so you know, if your tax return says that you should do something nice, you know, think of us, there you go, the end. Um, for the sake of full disclosure for this presentation, um, I am on the board of directors for the Sahana Software Foundation, I'm an advisor to the Humanitarian FOSS Project, and I, uh, OpenMRS is hosted by the OSU Open Source Lab, and I've had beers, at least one or two of them, you know, with uh, just about everybody who I talk about in this presentation, so they're all my friends, but that doesn't mean that they're not super awesome and you shouldn't help them. All right. This quote from uh, Mr. Cruz Jr. is actually in response to the use of Sahana software, which is a disaster management software suite during the Philippine mudslides two years ago. The reason that I'm showing you this quote is because I do think that part of the power of humanitarian free and open source software is saving lives in a, in a completely literal sense. But I also think it's more important to take a more expansive view of what humanitarian free and open source software is. Um, my introduction to open source about 10 years ago was somebody introducing me to a computer that had this big foot on it that I'd never seen. Foot looks kind of like this. And uh, when I was curious about this whole foot thing, I was informed uh, what open source was and that there were a bunch of developers all working together collaboratively to produce software that people could use, whether or not they could pay for it. And that all really made sense to me. And I think from the broadest, most expansive view of free and open source software as a humanitarian effort, if people have a need for a tool that they can't afford, our community efforts make that possible for them. So the first project that I wanted to talk about today was Koha. Um, this probably doesn't fit into the traditional sense of humanitarian free and open source software, but uh, I like the project, I think it's really cool. Uh, it's actually the world's first integrated library system, so the software tracks book checkouts and metadata on library collections. Pretty cool. Uh, it was actually created by New Zealand in response to a Y2K bug that they found in the proprietary software that they were using in 1999. And when they went to the vendor and asked them to help them out with this bug, they were basically told, ha, 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 yeah, no, 
Thanks. Or you can buy the new upgraded version for way more money than you can afford. And by the way, the new version doesn't actually support uh, accessing the system over dial-up, so all of your libraries that are on dial-up, namely all of them, yeah, we can't really help you out. So the Kiwis, being the resourceful people that they are, decided that they were gonna roll their own, and Koha was born. And it's now deployed in hundreds and hundreds of libraries worldwide. And in fact, in 2007, uh, the Vermont State Legislature was in a very similar bind. They were using a proprietary library management system for all of the collections in the state of Vermont. Uh, they went to the vendor ready for an upgrade, simply couldn't afford it, and switched over to Koha. So the, one of the largest installations of Koha anywhere in the world is actually the state of Vermont, which runs, it runs all of their library systems. If you'd like to get involved because you know, you know or love librarians, there's a URL there. And we can also talk about any of these projects after this presentation and I can get you in touch with the developer teams if you're interested. Um, OpenMRS, this is one of my absolute favorite projects. Um, how often do you get to hang out with open source software writing doctors? You do, okay, cool. <laughs> what do you guys do? <laughs> okay, how about you? That's awesome. So, um, I met the folks from the OpenMRS project when they applied as an organization to Google Summer of Code and I got to know a lot more about their work. Um, it's an electronic medical record system. If you consider what we're going through in the United States right now with uh, the VA open sourcing VISTA and looking for a custodial agent to take over that, and you consider the state of our own, yes? Uh, Respond to the RFP? Yeah. Exactly. If you consider the state of electronical medical records in the United States, the fact that one of the most sophisticated systems out there, already open source, was actually created for use in Africa by doctors who were trying to do aid work there and ensure that patients were getting proper health care for HIV um, because most of their records were taken on paper, which then gets covered with water, eaten by rats, et cetera, not particularly pleasant. Um, the other really great thing about OpenMRS is it's, since it's designed for resource-constrained environments, it's actually effective in a multitude of use cases. <clears throat> and the other great thing about this project that has been particularly interesting for me to watch is they have actually formed a relationship with the government of Rwanda and put in place a training program so that local developers are trained to do capacity building and actually are then employable to work on OpenMRS on behalf of the Rwandan government. So in addition to this being aid through software, it's also been aid of an economic development type. Uh, the Sonata Software Foundation, uh, everybody remember the horrible Indian tsunami? Or is that too long in internet time? Jerry remembers, excellent. So the Sonata Software Foundation actually came out of the Indian tsunami. In response to that, uh, a bunch of developers in Sri Lanka banded together and decided that they needed to create some software to manage the devastation in their country and then they wanted to share it more widely. Sahana has grown into three products now and it uh, kind of covers the gamut of everything from disaster relief and management from everything from managing your shelter inventory, helping you find displaced persons, helping you reconnect people with their families when they have gone missing due to a disaster. And I'm on their board and they're fantastic. And right now what's particularly interesting for those in the audience who may not be developers, Sahana is actually looking to add more to their community in terms of folks who can do translation, localization, documentation. They've got an awesome and very strong developer community and they're looking to branch out a bit more. So if you in the audience or someone you know is looking to get involved in an open source project but they're not really ready to jump in on the coding side, this is a great place for them to start. The Humanitarian OpenStreetMap project. Anybody heard of this? Has everybody heard of OpenStreetMap? All right, so uh, <clears throat> these folks are a lot of fun. They're the hotties. Um, I didn't give them that name but I think it's amusing. The Humanitarian OpenStreetMap project is a subset of the OpenStreetMap community. And these folks are basically creating all kinds of, they're taking OpenStreetMap's geodata and applying it for, for a variety of humanitarian purposes, everything from crisis management to election monitoring, et cetera. Um, these guys right now, I think their most interesting project that folks in the audience here would be excited about they're working on creating uh, an interface so that if you have offline satellite data and then you need to reconnect and you need to repopulate information on a map, they want to get that done. It's a non-trivial problem. So I don't know if any folks are interested in that sort of thing, but it should be exciting. Um, more from the academic angle. Um, how many of you folks uh, are completely self-taught versus having gotten college degrees? Completely self-taught hackers? Couple. How many of you folks study computer science? 
Okay, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, other engineering? Okay. So I've noticed in the open source world, and you folks can correct me if I'm wrong, but there seems to be a, uh, a general consensus that uh, to become a really great hacker, you kind of learn on your own. You don't really need to uh, learn this stuff in school. Do you guys feel like that's true or not? Yeah, kind of? All right. So what I think is particularly interesting about the Humanitarian FOSS project is it actually started because of a single professor at Trinity College in Connecticut named Ralph Morelli, and he put together this consortium of schools to teach college students to program uh, in an open source way. And the point of it actually was to pursue an NSF grant that was about broadening participation in computer science. So the actual purpose behind the creation of the Humanitarian FOSS project was the result of several studies that have shown that women and other underrepresented groups in computer science and engineering are more driven to participate if there is a goal in mind which has a social value. So <clears throat> uh, thus far to date, these folks have done contributions to GNOME specifically around accessibility, OpenMRS, the HANA project. Instead, they've put together some software for um, the Instead group who are working uh, on medical problems for folks in the developing world as well. And they've also done some pretty amazing applications that have uh, gotten a lot of attention. Uh, the, does anybody remember the Apps for Healthy Kids contest that the First Lady announced a couple months back? Yeah? So they're actually one of the award-winning applications. They came up with this really cool Android app called Work It Off. And you can take your phone and say like, I'm eating a delicious Krispy Kreme donut bread pudding with seasonal berries, which is totally on the menu in the bar. And I don't recommend you eat it because it's really, really good. Um, and it'll tell you, great, you just had an awesome bread pudding. In order to work that off, you need to do 300 sit-ups. So the idea is to reinforce the behavior that if you are inputting this many calories into yourself, yeah, you're going to have to do a lot to work it off. Um, another one of their award-winning applications is also actually called First Responder. This was in cooperation with Google. And there's a gentleman in the New York office at Google Incorporated who is a volunteer firefighter. And there was no actual useful way to organize all the volunteer firefighters in his neighborhood. So he got together with the folks at Trinity. And within a weekend, they put together a first responder application that's going to be used by the city of New York. Any folks here involved with academia at all? Please persuade your professors to host a chapter of one of these. Some of the most amazing code that I've seen have come out of these uh, folks. And this is actually a group of small liberal arts colleges. This is not your MITs and your CMUs. This is you know, a consortium of about 12 liberal arts colleges all up and down the East Coast. So they're doing great work. Anybody here heard of Engineers Without Borders? This isn't strictly open source. But I did want to bring it to folks' attention because it is more of an academically based project. Most folks who are affiliated with Engineers Without Borders, are, it's a bunch of student groups worldwide. Folks get together, do cool stuff for people all over the world. And if you know young students that you would like to encourage to do awesome things for the world, this is a great student group for them to get involved with or to start on their campus. And last but not least, everybody heard of Random Hacks of Kindness? I see a lot of heads nodding. For folks who aren't familiar with Random Hacks of Kindness, uh, this is a, <clears throat> it's a nonprofit organization that was put together by several different corporations with the goal of creating worldwide simultaneous hack fests that solve problems for humanity. And the last Random Hack of Kindness weekend was uh, June 4th and 5th. A lot of excellent applications came out of that. And really, this is working code within two days that's actually useful to solve real world problems. If you're interested in getting involved in the future, there's going to be a global water hackathon in October of 2011. The specific dates haven't been announced yet, but it's meant to solve the problem of access to clean and healthy water for everyone on the planet in whatever way uh, the participants get together and figure they can work on it. And there was another point I wanted to make about that. Anyway, it's rhok.org. I'm sorry I didn't put the URL up. And that, I, wow, I think I talked really, really, really fast. I totally blame the Diet Coke. Wow. Yeah, well, you know, that was a little extra sugar. Let's not talk about that. So do you guys have any questions? And I apologize for speaking so quickly.
Okay. You know, I mean, particularly if you're very deep in technology, I mean, you can find everything very analytical. It's, it's not, we're not, we can, sometimes we're not familiar with the genetic bunch. Um, I would have no idea what you're talking about, Mr. Carter. <laughs> <laughs> I'm working with you. I'm working with you. I'm empathizing. So, I mean, it seems like, it seems like part of this is, I mean, it's kind of like trying to come up with an idea for Mm -hmm. And um, and how can we? I mean, some ways it's about being better adults. I mean, how can we make this a part of you know how we teach technology in general? Instead of trying to, to teach it in a vacuum in terms of you know if you want to write a compiler, this is mm -hmm. what it will do. If you wanted to write a compiler, this is how it can you know make the world better. Right. And it, it's 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 a really big disconnect. No, I totally agree with you that there's a huge disconnect. And I think one of the things that's been most interesting to me, having worked with students in the Google Summer of Code program, where I was very much removed from the academic side of things, and then actually going to work at a university, um, I think a huge part of the disconnect is that typically um, professors feel like what they're trying to teach is theory. And it's theoretical, and we are teaching you to be a computer scientist, not a software engineer. And I think that a lot of that disconnect comes, comes through later on when we're talking about actually programming because, hey, I'm going to do this thing in this very abstract way, and in terms of real world application, wait, I'm going to do that in my first six months on the job and flounder and flail about and maybe not do as good a job as I'd like. Um, I'm working with a group of students at Oregon State University right now who are working to revise the undergraduate computing curriculum. We'll see if that gets some uptake, um, specifically to include things like open source. Um, Python programming, because not everyone needs to know Java apparently these days, who knew? So, yeah. So we'll see how that goes, and um, I'm looking forward to posting some news updates on the OSL blog about that process, and um, all of the curricular materials that are going to be developed for that are going to be Creative Commons, so other universities can use them. Is it beer clock yet? Yes, sir. If I may ask my colleague Deb if she would mind talking about some of her experiences. Deb, you... Awesome. And the project we did to sort of show them that, oh, you can edit images and do whatever you want with them. And try and pick the real place you'd like to go, and then we'll take pictures of you, and then I'll show you how to fix your telescope on the beach in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and I, I think it was successful in that uh, we had finished the whole thing, and now we're on Friday night learning computer skills and how to use JS and Inkscape. And so that was first. Um, That's definitely a win. Yes, we have a huge budget.
Oh, I agree. How much money do they spend on textbooks? How much money do they spend on every parent buying a copy of Not to Sell Profit for their kid instead of buying a copy of a 15 year old reader? Give me a credit card too. And you would put it on instead of buying a. Copy. I, I don't know that the ad goes, the, the Microsoft ad in that respect, but I don't know that. No getting in trouble. And in terms of other programs for high school students, I definitely wanted Deb to share her experiences with us because um, I know that she and Maureen put a lot of work into that. Um, Google actually holds, um, I believe it will now be annual, a contest for high school students to participate in open source projects. It's called Google Coding. Um, and basically the idea is that open source projects that participate produce a list of, of bite-sized bugs, um, easily manageable tasks that allow people to come in, be immediately productive, be paired with a mentor, get up to speed quickly, and learn to contribute to that project in a way that isn't terribly intimidating and isn't off-putting. And also with mentors who understand that they're working with you know, young people and you know, perhaps the off-topic channel is not where to invite them, for example. So I think that's, that's pretty cool. Um, and then the other thing is in terms of just the actual um, curriculum for high schools, uh, the one thing that is great is that the Computer Science Teachers Association of, of America has really recognized the fact that they need to do a lot more advocacy work to make sure that computing and technology and not just here's how to use a spreadsheet, for example, needs to be taught in high schools. <clears throat> Part of their resolutions for this year was to work with the National Science Foundation to roll out new programs in that area. And there's actually specifically an NSF grant called CE21 for anyone who would like to look it up on their website which is specifically uh, geared toward helping university researchers develop curriculum courses and actually teach those courses in high schools to help students um, actually get exposed to technology and for those students who are really adept at it to be able to go on and take the AP computer science exam whether or not it's actually offered in their area. So um, I definitely see progress happening there. I think it's slow, but I think we're headed in the right direction, which is a wonderful thing. CE-21. I think it's computing education for the 21st century is what it stands for. Well, and I think too that it's it's particularly difficult because if you just if you consider the pipeline for educators in general, um, there are people who will make very strong arguments that if you are an adept computer scientist or technologist, there's no reason for you to go to academia when the corporate world will pay you substantially more. And if you consider that that's the same would be true of high school teachers as well, I think that it's just it's a difficulty that. <clears throat> Market demand does not necessarily always reward altruism in dollars, and some folks um, have you know, bills to pay that are higher than that, which they can do on an academic salary. This is why you should all start clubs in your town so that these young people can come to them and learn more from all of you. Not that I have any opinions on this or anything. Yes, sir. Wow, that's a really long time for me. <laughs> About Open Vista? Mm -hmm. What would you? Vista, the Vista yeah. There isn't a relationship between Vista and OpenMRS, in so, except in so far as they're both electronic medical record systems. 
The reason that I was bringing up Vista when talking about OpenMRS was because I think that it's, it's actually pretty interesting that we have um, American computer scientists who are also trained as physicians working out of the Reagan Street Institute in Indianapolis, Indiana, which is actually the first place in the world that electronic medical records were ever kept. Um, I saw the Vax machines down in the basement that have the records from way back in the day. Hmm? Regan Street. Mm -hmm. So you have uh, American computer scientists and doctors creating open source electronic medical record software for deployment in Africa because they're trying to uh, handle the scourge of HIV there. And now, you know, seven, eight years after that project is founded, now here we are talking about like, let's take the largest possible electronic medical record system deployment in the world, which is Vista for the VA, and let's open source that and let's improve it for everybody because obviously this is going to solve all of our healthcare problems or at least a great deal of them. And I, I just think it's, um, I just think it's interesting to watch the way that um, our value systems have shifted in this country around those ideas and cost savings and how we handle patient data. This is one of those things I geek out on it late at night, which probably is totally interesting to you. Yes, sir. You know, um, you know, to be honest with you, that's not totally my area of expertise. I think that there are people who can make like dramatically good, you know, arguments for open core models versus completely free software models, and I'm just happy some of it's open source. I consider that, okay, you know, it's not a full victory, but a little victory is better than no victory at all. Any other questions, folks? Like, um, with open, I've never heard of open before. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. We actually host the Connect Open Source community at the OSL. Oh, the, the, one the community portal. Yeah. I thought. Okay, that's interesting. Good question. Actually, well, yeah. excellent. But um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, is there I, is there a relationship? We are is OpenMRS does it do essentially the same thing as the NHIN? Allow, no. Allow Not that I'm aware of. I think it's really more on a, I mean, there's, you can, you can make the networks larger depending on your use case. Like, you know, there are deployments that take in data for all of Rwanda or that focus on a specific hospital or a specific medical clinic that you can then sync to a larger database and compare data, but it's not the same okay, idea as connect. Activity. No. Okay. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Yes. Um, so a, a couple of different things happen depending on the situation. Most frequently with uh, the humanitarian OpenStreetMap team, uh, Geodata is required to do a variety of these humanitarian applications because of a certain crisis and either folks discover that the map data is not available at all and then they uh, rouse volunteers to go and actually do the mapping at that time and also help them to make sure that they're not going to be impacted by the crisis that's happening. Um, they also work with vendors to try to negotiate to get the map data for free or to get a license to use that content. Um, is that answering your question effectively? Yeah, yeah, because it's like a little common, little common. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anybody else? My dear friends, it's beer o'clock. Thank you very much for coming. This. I can help with like that. It. We have the same problem. What would happen if you did this? You gave me a I found a problem. How do you do that? It's like this. Well, I disagree with the word out. Let's put the word out. Put the word out.
As a service leader in cloud computing, all we do is hosted computing. To us, the cloud is just the next generation of hosting. And as someone who's been in the hosting industry for 12 years, we feel we're in a unique position to really help bring these two worlds together, these different sets of technologies, and to help companies embrace this new world and this great new tool that allows faster innovation. Not only is it about us being responsive and accountable, but it's about us doing more for you. WebOS, an OS that works the way that you do. Across all your devices, HP Slate and WebOS, HP.